Bo and Luke Nation, we are sitting here today with Kate Colbert. Kate is an accomplished marketer, speaker, speaker, market researcher, communications consultant, and the author of the acclaimed book, and everyone's going to love this book, Think Like a Marketer, How, to shift, how a Shift in Mindset Can Change Everything for Your Business. Uh, she's best known for helping organizations go beyond creative hunches, and I know we've all had those, to achieve data-driven di differentiation inspired by real customer insights. Uh, Kate comes from Illinois, just like I do, and went to ISU. She knows where Bradley University is, so we just hit it off absolutely immediately. She's a shark diver, a lion tamer. <laughs> uh, her training programs, well, getting back to marketing now, actually help participants from uh, mid-career to C-suite sharpen, sharpen their communication skills so they can have so they can open more do doors and close more deals. Kate is that person you want in to do a keynote presentation or you want to just come in and drop a bomb on your entire plan you had for marketing and actually drive some success. So Kate, welcome to the show. Whoop, whoop. Oh my gosh. Woohoo. Well, you'd, you'd make my mom proud by saying all that <laughs> nice stuff about me. So thank you so much. Um, you guys are a blast. I love listening to your show. So um, couldn't be uh, happier to be in the hot seat with you tonight. Yeah, this is awesome. Yes. Yeah, we're very, very, very glad to have you here. And I love, I love that part about, you know, turning creative hunches into data driven differentiation. So Kate, tell us, you know, in your line of work, what, what did you see? I'm super intrigued by the past 14, 15 months. We've heard plenty of stories, had lots of guests on here that even guests who've launched companies in 2020 um, and did well. But I think it's important differentiator between a creative hunch and an actual data-driven decisions and differentiators is, are you on the right page or on the right path? So start us out talking a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so the unfortunate um, but important thing I think to know about leaders who make hunch-based decisions is mm -hmm. they're often some of the smartest people. So they've been in their career or their area of functional expertise for 20 years, they're a business owner, maybe they're a marketer. So they're like, well, I don't have to go do the market research. I'm a marketer. I know what works, right? Um, and so we get sort of um, stuck in our own underwear, as one of my um, colleagues used to say, we get tangled up in this like sense that we know. Mm -hmm. And so we'll rush to the creative because it's fun, right? So the salespeople want to start selling it and the marketing people want to start marketing it. And, and the CEO wants to see the billboard on the highway. And so we rush to the creative coming up with what are we going to name the product and what are we going to mm -hmm. name the, the company and you know what should the logo look like? Because that's the fun stuff. Um, and then we don't really know what the marketplace needs or wants. We don't know um, what they don't want. We don't know what they're willing to pay. And so mm -hmm. what's really interesting is that I work with organizations at every possible place in their life cycle. So I've had a lot of companies come to me when they're launching mm -hmm. and they say, I'm so excited. I'm starting this consulting business in the cloud computing space. And this is the name of the company. Mm -hmm. And I say, no. Uh. <laughs> so first, so first of all, about 80% of all companies that come to me at launch um, have done all of this. They're like, I've, I've copyrighted it and trademarked it. And I bought the website and I bought the, and they're horrible names. Like they're, mm -hmm. they're names that are just like named for their third dog or something. And, you know, and they just don't mean anything to the marketplace. And I always tell people, listen, you can name a product or a company, anything you want to, um, and you have the right to teach the marketplace that name that to make mm -hmm. it mean something, right? So you can have a um, sort of nonsensical name, Google, Yahoo, yeah. you can have a confusing name, PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, um, but you're going to spend a lot of money teaching the marketplace who you are, what yeah. that means, what it means to them and how to spell it. Um, and so, so a lot of small businesses need to, to sort of kind of focus yeah. a little bit more. Yeah, so, so the data really matters. Um, and it, I don't care if you're starting a company with $5 million or $500, you have got to do the research first. Yeah, I always like, you're a, I think you're spot on. I always like the one where you see the commercials and I don't remember there was one of the big consulting companies, they changed their name to BDO and, yeah. and you see the commercial and then you got these business people and it's like, and it's real serious. Like, Hey, I thought this wasn't going to go, Hey, we're covered. We brought in BDO. 
And then the viewers like, I'm sitting there, I'm like, who's BDO, right? right. What is that? And, and yeah, so you got to do dig. You got to yeah. dig for that. And you're right. Yeah. They're going to spend tons of cash trying to figure, let people know who they are. Right. BDO spends a lot of money um, on their advertising and often um, maybe not particularly well placed. Yeah. Um, so, but they have really cool robots in some of their more recent commercials, which I'm fascinated about how warehouses don't even really need people. Everything moves by a robot. So yeah, that's a big that's conversation. Cool. It is cool. Yeah. I live down the street from an Amazon warehouse. So um fascinated oh, by logistics. So. Yeah. <laughs> so now what do people do with names though? So I've, I've been part of starting a few business names and there's like listeners, if you ever like, Hey, this is a great name for a business. You're pretty much at the peril of what's available in .com domains. And there is nothing that's under like 50 grand. Yeah. So that's a little bit tricky. Um, but then you have to think about whether or not you can have a company name and a domain name that instead of matching, could they dovetail somehow? And so an example of this, and it's going to sound like I work with a lot of IT people, which I don't, but this just happens to come to mind as a, another technology example. So there's a, there's a cloud computing company, a virtual server company called Versage, and nobody has, knows how to spell it because it looks no. like Versace. It's V-E-R-S-A-G-E. Um, so I don't know if they couldn't get the domain name or maybe they do own it, but I think that they didn't knew people didn't know how to spell it or they weren't going to remember it. Their web address is neverbuyanotherserver.com. Hmm. See, so, this is why we have Kate Colbert on the show. Right? Everybody, so, yes. and, and this is, by the way, very, very helpful to the sales yeah. team. And again, Luke, this is your expertise on the sales side. But if you're trying to sell something, you're trying to solve a problem for the customer, maybe it makes sense for your web address to be the solution to the problem or to be the brand promise that you make or your mission statement if you're a nonprofit. So, so I'm not saying you don't want to own the name. So one of the companies I own was a derivative of, of our parent company. Mm -hmm. And so it was the right name to give it because it was sort of, you know, it's like when you have a baby, you're going to give it your same last name, right? But when you find out the web address for your baby and your last name don't exist, then what? And that's what happened with one of our, our um, smaller companies. And so we fought and fought and fought. And it took three years to be able to buy the domain name back from the people who owned it but weren't using it. Um, and so we used a brand promise as our address um, for a very long time, for about three years, until we got it back. So um, hmm. there are definitely some, some strategies for sure. Yeah, you have me thinking about it in a completely different way now. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's cool. But then it's key to come up with how you connect the two, the names, right? And to what you do, right? Yeah. If it's not your actual company name, connected to connecting it to what you do, that's brilliant. Yeah, and, and I think, yeah. and you were going to, I think, Luke, you were going to ask a question about sort of like, were you, you going to ask me about like how, what kind of bad names or sort of what are the mistakes people are making when they come to me? I would love to hear what the bad names are, what kind of mistakes. Yeah, because it, because- when we were going through this exercise with other co-owners, like we were just like, Kate, we're just making stuff up at that yeah. point. Cause we're like, yeah. we, we type in like a hundred domain names, taken, 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 yep. taken. Right. And then we're like, you know, we're, we're like molding three words together that make no sense. And it was just yeah. a terrible rabbit hole. Yeah. Uh -huh. So no, I mean, nomenclature is a science, right? Like, you know, <laughs> like, like we don't, when, when somebody, when scientists find a new flower or, um, they give a whole lot of thought to what they're going to name it. It's not just like, can we get the domain name? And so there has to be a lot of thought. I had the opportunity early in my career when I was a director of marketing to rename a medical sciences university that was a hundred years old. Mm -hmm. And there was, and it had, it was home of four colleges at the time, including the Chicago medical school. And it's now Rosalind Franklin university of medicine and science. And we spent about six months working our tails off, figuring out what was the right name for this institution and why, and what would last them the next 150 years and why. Um, and for us, um, so, the, so I'll use an example for that one. So, so they, they had all these schools that people knew independently, Chicago Medical School, the Dr. William M. Scholl College of Podiatric Medicine, right? Dr. Scholl's and feet, right? Um, and how do you put a name on top of all of it, of a school where people get a PhD in immunology or they get their MD um, and they become a cardiologist, they become a physical therapist, a PA, et cetera. How do you come up with one name that incorporates all of those programs? 
Um, and we took a look at what we wanted that institution to stand for when it, it competing against 125 other similar institutions. And we knew that the old way of practicing medicine went a little something like this. You show up and say, I have this cough or I have this rash or I don't feel good or my gut hurts and the doctor diagnoses and then tries to treat you. Diagnosis and treatment is the model that we've been really used to. But the future of medicine is really looking at the human genome and looking at our family history and the way we eat and the way we exercise and the way we live and the way we behave and taking a look at rather than diagnose and treat you, what if we could predict and prevent? Mm -hmm. And that's mm. a different way to think about medicine. And we knew as an institution, we wanted to be kind of on the leading edge of that approach to medicine. And we also wanted to be interprofessional. So we wanted physical therapists, podiatrists, um, mm -hmm. you know, allopathic doctors all in the same anatomy labs together, year one, et cetera. And so we said, well, what, what sort of leads us to this? And we said, well, we could not predict or prevent um, health issues if we didn't understand the human genome. So the discovery of DNA was at the root of our ability to practice medicine the way that we wanted to teach it at this institution. And so we took a look at Dr. Rosalind Franklin, um, the British scientist who um, discovered the structure of DNA. And then we started learning more about who she was and discovered that Watson and Crick stole her data and won the Nobel Prize um, with her data. And, and the more we knew about her story, the more enamored we were and we realized she was the kind of name we wanted to put on top of our institution. And so we reached out to her brother and said, he was like 83 at the time. And we mm. said, there's a medical school in Chicago that wants to name their institution um, after your sister. Um, and, and the rest is history. But we spent months and months and months getting stakeholder um, buy-in at mm -hmm. every level from the board to the students, to the alumni, et cetera, um, but without getting the word out. So we had hundreds of non-disclosure agreements signed. Wow. So, so it was the day that we actually unveiled it and had the media there and had 3000 people um, in a big auditorium and we unveiled it. Um, the people in the room had no idea what the university's name was. So that's so cool. Yeah, it was a million dollar event. It was one of the, the most, impressive, fun things I've ever done. But people come to me all the time when they're they're launching something little, right? Uh, they're a solopreneur and they're starting a company. And they say, well, how can I do research? Like, I don't, I don't, it doesn't exist yet. I had a woman come to me who um, had a company name and I just thought this is a failure. This, like there's somebody in your marketplace down the street from you in San Diego who has a company with exactly the same name in a different space. Um, mm -hmm. So she was a technology company, they, they were finance. Um, and I said, I really want to understand what makes you different. And she really couldn't give me the answers I needed. And she didn't have any colleagues at the time. And she wasn't willing to let me talk to former employers or what have you. So I said, can I interview your husband? And she's like, for real? I said, for real. And I said, and I'd like for you not to be there. And so I interviewed her husband. Um, and I started asking him what makes her so special. Uh -huh. You know, what makes her so successful in her career? Why did Microsoft hire her, you know, over and yeah. over again? What makes her so special? And what I found out was that she has this larger than life, but very kind personality. And people just naturally, her name is Maureen, people just naturally have an affinity for her. And she's one of those people who will open her proverbial Rolodex and connect you to anybody you need to know. She mm. knows everyone. Um, and her service service um, offering was in the cloud computing space. She was working for organizations that wanted to get rid of their servers. Um, and so we um, threw away her company name and all the work she had done on it. We renamed the company Affinity Cloud Connections. Um, and it was named um, one of the top five um, sort of companies to watch in that space the next year. So um, it really does behoove you to take the time, even after you've designed the logo, to like really check yourself and to say, have I got this right? Because you do want to be in a place 20 years from now that either the business is still thriving under the original name um, or you've sold it or you've retired or what have you, but you don't want to have to keep renaming it. Just take it from a girl who's done the renaming thing for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, I make good money doing it. Um, you don't want to have to pay me to do it. So, <laughs> <laughs> right? so gotta, get it, get it right the first time. <laughs> you got to cut the Bo and Luke show a break. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, we, we put tons of resources, time, effort. Into coming up with that name. Yeah. Consultants, yeah. you name it. Well, I mean, decades and, you know, parentage and somebody else decided for you. That's right. 
That's what I did. <laughs> That's so cool that you interviewed uh, her husband for that. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want you to interview my wife. I'd be scared about the crap she'd say about me. Yeah. He told me some interesting <laughs> stories about her. Um, so, you know, but yeah, I mean, getting the, the name right is important. Yeah, no, I, I, you can see where all of us self-included where we mess up on, on names, even if you have some success in your business, right. But you could, you're, you get in that the first staffing company that I opened uh, was my business partner and I, we opened it and we ended up taking a piece of his, my last name and a piece of his last name is Bravo West. And you just end up explaining to everybody all the time. What's that? What's your company do? You know, blah, blah, blah. And um, yeah, then, then, but then you're in the space and you're like, oh, you know, we could have yeah. done better. It needs to mean something. So let me give you an mm -hmm. example, since I know we're all like animal lovers or at least dog lovers, right? Oh, so, yes. um, so I mean, it, for the cat people who are listening or watching, like we love you too, but achoo. Um, and so, um, but, but there, so there is a toy that my dogs love, um, and they are heavy chewers. So I have a Sheltie, um, two American Eskimos and a Pomeranian and three out of four love to chew, um, to the point that they will swallow things. And we have now spent $20,000 on emergency gut surgeries for just one of them in the last wow. three years. Oh yeah. No, he's like the, yeah. Gold plated dog at this point. But, mm. um, so there are these these dog toys that have a really cool story they're green um, and they sort of look sort of like an x um, they were designed by a company that makes agricultural products they make farm equipment products mm -hmm. and these are essentially I, i'm not a mechanical person so i'll get it all wrong but essentially it's sort of like a thick like bushing or washer or something that kind of goes between two parts of a wheel i think like on a tractor um, it sort of creates a cushion and they were in their conference room working on something and they accidentally dropped one one day and it bounced. And one of the office dogs came and grabbed it and took off running. And they were like, hmm. hmm. Um, so they're made from a non-toxic um, sort of uh, product. Um, they're really hard to break. When they do break, they come up hard in just little like rice sized pieces. So nothing that's gonna hurt your dog if I swallows it. Um, and they bounce in this kind of haywire way, which dogs think is really fun. Um, and so they thought, I think we could sell these to like pet stores um, yeah. and get the extra ones off our shelves. And so they did. And we're always, we can, they're not easy to find online all, all the time. And they're not, and, but we never forget what it's called at our house. Cause it's these green things that has this interesting story from this agricultural and it's for the dogs to chew on. It's called agri-chew. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. Like now somebody probably thought that was a really boring name, Agrichu, right? As a customer who buys four of these suckers every six months um, and yeah. I need to go buy them again. I love the fact that I never forget the products. Name. Yeah. I might have a couple of those in my house actually. Yeah. yeah. They're green. Now that yeah. you're describing them. I have a green one. Do they have an orange one by chance? I don't think so. They might have another product, but yeah, they're for sure. We've got green ones all over our house, but Agrichu, right? And so the other thing too, is companies sometimes get bored with their own name. I actually almost changed my um, core company's name, you know, 10 or 15 years into the business because I was kind of bored with it. And then I started asking my customers because I don't do anything without the data. Little mm -hmm. Miss, I'm actually wearing a bracelet right now that says data driven on it. Um, uh, but, cool. <laughs> um, and so I asked my customers and they're like, we love your company name. Like we wouldn't even recognize it if we got an email from somebody else. Or, um, and I found out that my company name had brand equity in it mm. with its stakeholders. And so you want to be careful not to change it, even if you're bored. That would be like if somebody with like fresh new ideas showed up at Coca-Cola and said, kind of tired of the red can with the white swoosh. Let's yeah. go purple. <laughs> it's like, mm. Mm. I'm yeah. sure they're sick of everybody who works there. I'm sure is sick and tired of red and white, um, yep. but it works. Um, and you don't want to abandon what's working. Yeah, no, that's for sure. So tell us, Kate, right? Because part of your expertise lies in counseling entrepreneurs and business leaders and um, really how to pandemic proof their business. Big, 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 big. That has more meaning today than it ever has probably in yeah. the past. Um, yeah. How, you know, how do you do that? I, I, mean, that, I mean, that's probably a loaded question. Um, but what are some of the things for any of our business leaders listening uh, that you've run across the past 15 months that, you know, to help people through or yeah. things that you had set up previous clients with 
that did this. And then they, I don't want to say they sailed through it, but you know, there are companies that prospered that have been prospering in the last 14 months yep. um, and others that have, you know, gone bankrupt and fallen to the wayside. Yeah. So what, what are some of those things that you talk to your clients? Yeah. About? So I definitely have some top tips and I've, I've been paying a lot of attention um, and don't get any ideas about uh, the domain name pandemic proof your business. Cause I already own it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was sick with COVID in isolation when I bought that domain name. That's awesome. Um, I'm always thinking like a marketer, right? Um, so a couple of things that, that um, I've seen that, that have been uh, making a big difference. So first of all, I, I always counsel people, I've been counseling people during good times to be thinking about what your business doesn't do, right? Yeah. So a lot of times when we're marketing and selling um, our services or our brand, we're always telling people like, we're the company that, I'm the person who, right? This is the product that solves this problem. And we should be doing that. Mm -hmm. But especially in, in professional services spaces or um, higher education or healthcare, things that are high involvement, not where you're not just asking for a lot of money, but you're asking somebody to spend four years of their life, for example, or do a bunch of homework or something complicated. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be thinking about what you don't do because sometimes people will buy you for what you don't do, right? So Southwest Airlines, bags fly free, right? Uh, mm. they, don't, they don't charge for bags. Um, I am incredibly loyal to them because of that, because I'm a cheapskate when it comes to that kind of stuff. And I'm a heavy packer. So I will take a seven day trip and I will take 15 pairs of shoes and I don't apologize for it. And so, um, so what don't you do? Are you a marketing agency that doesn't charge retainers? You know, um, you know, are you, and so start thinking about what you don't do that your top competitors do. And instead of apologizing for it or, or explaining it, like, well, we do it different because like we're, so long before the whole world went virtual, mm -hmm. my team was living all over the country. And I had a lot of people who thought that was really innovative, right? And that we worked <laughs> in different time zones and we were on yeah. video conference all the time. Um, and, and my explanation was, I don't make my clients suffer with the best talent I could find locally when I could hire the best of the best anywhere in the world mm -hmm. if I'm willing to figure out how to manage and engage a remote workforce. Yeah, true. And so I figured out how to step up as a leader and do that, right? And so that became like one that. of our differentiators. So now that we're in a pandemic, one of the things that I think folks should be thinking about is okay, maybe you're clear on what you don't do and how that helps you or just makes you different. Now ask yourself all the things you don't do. We're a restaurant that doesn't deliver. We're a whatever, right? Now ask yourself, but what if you had to? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. think about how many organizations, um, even when it would have been a strange academic exercise to go through pre-2020, if somebody had said to the local mom and pop, um, shop that has the best biscuits and gravy in town or the best pancakes in town, um, why don't you deliver? And they would say, because we don't have to, right? But what if somebody had said to them, what if you did? What if your dining room burned down, but the kitchen was still intact? What if for some reason, right? And we, we didn't pr foresee what happened, but what if for some reason you had to? Mm -hmm. How might you reinvent your business right now if you take a look at the things that you do? So, um, you know, what if, what if we couldn't video conference and how would we do things? What if we couldn't? And so make a list of the things mm. that you yeah. don't do right now that you don't want to do and legitimately might not need to do, but then ask yourself, what if we had to? Mm -hmm. Could we scale up to that? Could we pivot to that really quickly? And if we think there is even a 10% chance that that could ever happen, that we, that our hand would be forced in this way. Mm -hmm. How do we test it now? How do we prototype it now? Um, and by the way, you can prototype a lot of things without creating your own, you don't spend a whole lot of money, right? So if you're a restaurant and you don't want to buy vehicles with, you know, branded and wrap them, you know, with Bo and Luke's pizza and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff um, and hire delivery drivers, go ahead and, and yeah. let Grubhub deliver for you now and see how that goes yeah. um, and see if you can create demand in a particular space. So that's one of the big things is to start asking yourself, but what if I had to, yep. and then, then start trying to do it. The other thing I think that um, folks need to be thinking about now is that the sort of palette 
and sort of expectations of customers in business to business and business to consumer spaces changed because of the pandemic. So mm -hmm. we're willing to live without a lot of things. We're willing to live without hugs from our family. We're willing and, and able to live without eating out in a restaurant for a year. There's a lot of things we learned to let go of. As such, customers and the world over right now are actually looking for solutions that are more bite-sized than before and that are more simplified than before. So let me give you a couple of examples. So my book, Think Like a Marketer, um, has done very, very well since it came out. And it's the right book for a lot of people, um, whether you own a business or you lead inside of a Fortune 500. Um, but there are a lot of people who are really, really busy who are not going to sit down and read all 281 pages or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't want to start a chapter but feel like they didn't finish it. There are some people who feel like a failure if they don't finish a book. So Think Like a Marketer is actually being um, remixed um, and broken up into four mini ebooks by topic. Nice. Um, so if you have a particular pain point in this area, you want to read this one. Okay. And they're really affordable yeah. and they're going to be coming out later this year. So how do you create mini books from an existing book? Um, so those are some things to be thinking about. Um, I heard a really great story about um, a Mexican restaurant that was hit really, really hard as most, most restaurants were with the pandemic. And they had a very large menu. I mean, think like Cheesecake Factory, like where, yeah, where you think, oh, how in the world can they have all these ingredients in the kitchen and not have half of it go bad? Because they can't mm -hmm. possibly sell all this stuff. Yep. So this particular restaurant said, okay, we, we don't know if anyone's coming in to eat today, if anyone's picking up food. And so we can't, we will go out of business so fast if we have to stock all of these perishables. So they said, we're going down to two products pork burritos and pork burritos with green sauce, which is basically one product with or without <laughs> green sauce, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and they just made a big deal out of their customers, your favorite product, our best seller, like we're not closing our doors, we're still open curbside pickup. What do you want with or without sauce? And uh -huh. they became more like a food truck with one awesome product. And guess what? They're doing just fine. Yeah. So sometimes it's about how can we simplify? How can we make things a little bit more bite-sized? I would also say the other thing right now, if you want to stay alive and in a mm -hmm. post-pandemic world or protect yourself for the future, be thinking about how do you marry high touch, really personalized services with high tech convenience? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people think those are two sides of a coin. It's you, you are either high touch personalized or you're high tech and convenient. And I'll give you an example of, of how you can marry those. A member of our team, her daughter was injured this year um, in a, a downhill sledding accident and broke her back, hit a tree, Ooh. She was a 15 year old mm. girl. And she's doing great, but she was very, very seriously injured. Um, and I called Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago um, and said, I wanna be able to send a gift. And I had this very personalized experience with a gal whose voice I would recognize to this day if I talked to her. And I told her what I was looking for and she gave me all kinds of ideas. She walked around the gift shop, described all the different stuffed animals to me. I had this unbelievable concierge-like service. And then she said, okay, what's your email address? And I gave it to her and she told me it's gonna cost about this, expect to see an email. Mm -hmm. Got off the phone with her. I get an email from their partner, a technology company that then I go ahead and type in exactly what I want to say on the card. So there's nothing lost in translation and that phone conversation, nothing spelled wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I go ahead and um, approve. I put the credit card number in. So the people in that gift shop never handled that information. And then all day long, I kept getting updates. You know, the gift has been wrapped and it's ready. It's at the nurse's station. Yeah. The gift has been wrapped. It has been taken from the nurse's station and it's at Abby's bedside. She has it. What? That's yeah. cool. Okay. Cool. And so very started out very personalized, very, very high touch, mm -hmm. ended with incredible convenience. Um, and again, so be asking yourself if you run a small business or a large one, um, and you like to provide really, really high touch services and personalized service, is there somebody who has sort of built an app for that, um, that mm -hmm. could tuck into the business that you do that would give your customers everything they want? Mm -hmm. um, so, the, so I would say those yeah. are the, the big lessons of the pandemic is bite-sized, simplified, and merry high touch, um, it, it sort I, of personalized with convenience. And I technology. think that's fantastic and fun, not funny story, but I, I watch this stuff because uh, I'm fascinated with, you know, I'm a business owner, so I'm fascinated with how other people are doing their business and what processes. We talk a lot about systems on this podcast with 
every everybody that we have on the show. Yeah. And this, what you're talking about here, you know, this is something that they did. So our local Chick-fil-A, right? Yep. What did they not do before the pandemic? They didn't have people outside at the order station for the drive-through taking That's the true. orders. You speak into the speaker. People are inside, right? Okay. Well, when when all of a sudden the insides close, but drive-throughs could stay open, they open up, they have double lanes and they're like, they, they pivoted quick. This is what we don't do, but if we have to, how do we do this? And they made it happen quickly, right? So they started stationing people outside too late. I mean, they just had this system working like there's yep. no tomorrow. It's a machine. It's a machine, right? And everybody's outside. They equipped them with the equipment. So the person could take your payment right there, swipe yep. the card, no issue whatsoever, right? They did that from, my gosh. They started that in like, it wasn't, I don't know, maybe April, May-ish yeah. of last wow. year. So then they go through the summer, right? The weather's good. People can be outside. They get to this winter. And now mind you, because they, they're like a machine, they're quick, they're fast. That line had 50 to cars plus in it all day long. Yep. Right? Okay. So they decided it got cold outside. They're going to switch it back to Oh no. Order at the order at the the audio device, right? No more people oh, no. outside. That lasted for like three days. Yeah. <laughs> I kid you traffic's backed up in, onto yep. the 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 main street that it's on, right? You got traffic backed up. They slowed down probably by five hundred percent slower um, because they got rid of the people outside. And the next thing you know, they put the people back outside, they have heating systems. Yep. above the overhang for everybody <laughs> and we just noticed the other day they put in wind barriers that look like almost like shout these big giant industrial shower curtain things that slide yeah. so the wind can't come in and hit the people outside working and we're back to the back to business so right? i would i would yeah. almost guarantee now that that will be one of those things that would not ever end up in that bucket again of what we don't do right yeah. isn't that in interesting of what we do do because the customers tried it and they liked it and it yeah. worked. And so anybody from Chicago knows that Portillo's nailed that years I ago. I was just so, thinking of that. Were you just case. thinking of that, that Luke? Yes. So, so Portillo's does. So like, you know, it's like Portillo's like the place to go get like hot dogs or beef sandwich or whatever. Um, now, by the way, I am a big supporter of simplifying your menu, right? But I eat a very limited diet. I have celiac disease, so I don't eat bread or buns. Um, and I don't eat meat either, but I eat seafood. Um, and so they got rid of their grilled tuna salad. Oh, no. <laughs> so it's, they took, it's one of the things they took off their menu. So I've been, um, not getting anything from Portillo's except the gluten-free French fries, which I don't need, but, um, oh but they've you, you been having have... people outside. Like, I mean, they just put on the parkas and the, and they just, you know, you hire a 17 year old and you pay them really well and you tell them where layers welcome to Chicago. Um, and they've right. been doing it. And I would say they were one of the only places that we just didn't see a hiccup um, when the pandemic hit. So oh, you um, can't, you yeah. can't keep anyone away from Portillo's. I have dreams really? about Portillo's. Yeah. I live in Virginia, Cape, yeah. by the way now. And I would, I look up every six months if they'll franchise Portillo's and they won't, I actually came up with a scheme. So I heard this might be a rumor probably true but they said they they figure out where they're going to open new stores around the country by where most of the online orders come from so also, I actually you should order a lot that's what i thought <laughs> i was like so how many thousands of dollars were the portillos that i have to order in order for them to put one in Rowan. That's Virginia. hilarious that's yeah. hilarious no portillos was the very first place that i stepped inside of um after the pandemic hit they were the first restaurant i saw open the interior and they're very very well known for being like shoulder to shoulder jam-packed people shouting you know for orders and stuff um and um but there's like nobody in there because they're like 80 percent of the seating is shut, shut down and it was kind of creepy but um but yeah the, we still go through the drive through and the closest one is 35 minutes from us and hmm. we'll you know if we're headed that direction going to visit my oh mom, you got to you know? Oh yeah. Chop, chop salad for my husband. Yeah. <laughs> my so. wife tried to get me to bring cheese sauce on a plane back from Virginia. Just You're like, that's not going to, that's not going to, yeah, that's not, gonna, no that's not going to be okay. That's not going to be okay. Bo, it's, you, I want to take you to Portillo's someday, Bo. It's, you yeah. can get a burger, hot dogs and Italian beef. And if you want to chocolate be, cake, Oh, the chocolate cake, Bo, they have a chocolate cake shake where they put really? the chocolate cake, <laughs> put cake in the milkshake. No yeah, kidding. blend it up. 
it's just wrong. The lemon cake, I can't eat any of this because of my allergy, but like yeah. I make my husband, I'm, he knows he's not allowed to start eating the chocolate cake until I smell it. So wow. that's fair. That's I'm a, fair. That, that is my brand positioning, by the way, is I am the smellitarian. So I can't eat anything, but I, I will sniff your food. <laughs> so. oh, that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And Bo, you can even get a giant, like they have these frozen goblets. It's a goblet that they put beer in. It's like a tub of beer. Wow. The chalice. It's amazing. It's a, it's a yeah. rite of passage. Next time you're in the Milwaukee or Chicago area, I will take you. Last time, last time Bo was in the area, I took he and his, his wife on a, a boat tour um, in awesome. Geneva, taught them all about like Geneva. <laughs> Hugh Hefner and the original Playboy Club, which we used to go to when we were kids. When we were yeah. kids. Yeah, I've never <laughs> I don't there. know what, I'm not sure what that says about my parents and my aunts yeah. and uncles, but yeah. That they were fun. awesome. <laughs> they were cool. Yeah. 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 You know, what's funny about that? Kate and I were talking the other day. Um, we did this photo shoot for my book launch and the photographer, Daniel Bell, he's an amazing photographer, right? And this was fall 2019. Yeah. And then COVID hit, talk about a pivot. We need to get Daniel on the podcast too. You've got to interview a, him. Talk about a pivot. This guy, this guy, he's a wedding photographer. It's a lot of on-site photography. COVID hits what goes away on-site photography. Yeah. Right. So his business almost, I would imagine probably went it to pretty much evaporated. Yeah. yeah. Like it's yeah. just gone. Right. Oh. Kind of like a local gym. I mean, the gyms are just, yeah. you know, it stops, can't go. Right. There's no, no way to do it. Luke, he is a top TikTok sensation. That's awesome. Yeah. We got to have him on. He's got over a million followers on Instagram. You know, it is hitting his videos are funny yeah. as can be. And they're all, they're clean They're I mean, there's, there's like no, yeah. there's audio, oh, yeah. but there's very no wholesome, like verbal, very yeah. wholesome, just, and talk about effort that he oh, puts into the video. So he's in complete video production brand. De- I mean, I guess brand deals, you name it. Right. Oh yeah. Um, he's the, and, and, a and, and a lot of it is talk about, so talk about knowing, understanding your uniqueness. Right. Yeah. So, so Daniel Lavelle is the only person I know who, who has um, biceps as nice as Bo. And <laughs> so, like, <laughs> and, and um, so Daniel is like, and Daniel is, you know, a uh, a former cross country runner. Um, and he figured out that one of his differentiators when he was doing all this uh, brand photography and wedding photography is that if he was super, super fit, he could get shots that other people couldn't. He could slither around the ground. He could, cl- he literally climbed a yeah. tree to get a picture of me once. Um, you know, he, he will say, walk towards me like naturally. And he will run backwards as he's getting the shot. And he's so fit. Like the things that the, his, his balance, his mm. strength, it's unbelievable. Um, and he used to tell me, he's like, I hate working out, but when I'm at the gym, I re- I remind myself, I am a better photographer because of how fit I am. Once he became sort of this TikTok sensation with all of these videos he creates, um, he figured out that he knows how to do masterful pratfalls, really funny stuff. You know, he can run so fast. It looks like they sped it up, but it's actually in real time. Um, and he wow. knows how to do most of it. And I asked him when I talked to him recently, I'm like, how often do you get hurt? I'm like, come on. I'm like, you're literally like, he'll be at the bottom of his basement stairs and like in one leap will jump six stairs or something. I'm like, how, like you had to pull something. Like how mm. often are you getting hurt? And he's like, no, I don't think I've really ever, he does stuff where he'll like run backward on the treadmill and then like go jumping off. And, um, and he says he really never gets hurt. Um, but again, yeah. he, he knew what made him unique in terms of his physique um, and sort of this, and he happened to have a degree in multimedia and he knew how to edit video, which was hilarious because he once told me he never wanted to do video projects because it wasn't really his thing. Wow. Yeah. So another great question, like, what do I not do? I don't do video. I'm a still photographer, <laughs> I don't do video. right? And right. <laughs> so it'll be interesting video. to see, I mean, you'll have to ask him when you interview him. It'll be interesting to see when somebody like that, when they discover another strength and another niche and they find that there is a market for it that will pay yeah. for it um you know i'm still counting on him to do more headshots and stuff for me and like <laughs> beg him but i live local to him and he's a personal friend um yeah. but i recently tried to get him to do a headshot like we did to do a shoot like he, we did for you Bo. um and he literally told me there is no amount of money you could pay me and he's like, I just don't have time. He's like, I make so much money off of the advertising of my videos and, and the brand deals for the clothing that I wear. He's like, I just, I, he's like, I just, I would have to charge so much. It wouldn't be fair to the client. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. So yeah. we got to have him on. Yeah, yeah. He's a blast. Yeah. We'll get him. Whose biceps are nicer, Bose or Dan's? Not mine. He's, I, I don't know. His, he's, he's like, he's ripped. fit, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. The, yeah. He's got the got whole six definition. pack abs going on and stuff too. He's young. I mean, he's like 10 years younger than me. So like he's got age on his young side guy. for sure, he's but he works the... hard. He works hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's Luke, cool. You, you just, you just got to come up with something that you can do on TikTok and just become a sensation. I could, I could attempt to do the type of physical things that Dan does after yeah. he does them, like turn around on the treadmill and try to jump <laughs> off and then just bust Okay, here's the thing, Luke. There's a see. huge market for that. So if you, don't follow, if you don't follow Celeste Barber on Instagram, <laughs> you have to, the Australian um, comedian. Uh -huh. So she takes all the pictures of like supermodels doing like really weird, sexy, strange things. And then she puts on similar outfits and tries to like fake it looking stupid. And, and she's beautiful, but she's, you know, like these supermodels are like, you know, half her size because they're not normal. Yeah. Um, and she's a riot. So yeah, they're actually that whole, um, you know, sort of playing the foil to somebody or spoofing somebody. There's a huge market for that. See, that I would mean, be great. So, I'd be good at that. Yeah. You'd be really good at that. <laughs> cool. And to get me on for the sure. treadmill. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> cool. Well, Kate, we could keep you talking all night. Cause there's so many different topics that you could unpack out of marketing and thinking like a marketer and, and so forth. Lots around the whole marketing topic as a whole. Um, but tell people how, how they can find your book, how they can learn more about you uh, and, and take it from there. Yeah, great. And if I could offer a sort of a last word, because I feel yeah. like we, we should have said something about um, HR, um, really not just as a nod um, to your area of expertise, Bo, but because it's really important right now. And so mm -hmm. um, I would say the world has changed in terms of how we're all working because of the pandemic. Um, and if you're not investing in communications training and coaching um, of your leaders and your mid-level managers, your, your um, entry-level folks, um, you need to be thinking about what the result of that is. So if mm -hmm. you want the people who work for you to be able to open doors to relationships or customers or key stakeholders and close deals to, to Luke's side of the expertise in terms of um, sales, um, they have to be good communicators first. If they can't communicate effectively, face-to-face, -face, on video, in an email, via text, et cetera, um, you're going nowhere. So investing in communications training and coaching, I think, is really, really vital. Um, and then teach them how to communicate for connection and meaning, not just to transact sales. So it's about, it's about relationship. Um, yeah. So in terms of keeping in touch, um, I am pretty easy to find on social media. I really, really love when people reach out um, via LinkedIn. It's a great way to um, start a conversation and to keep mm -hmm. a relationship going. So I'm just simply Kate Colbert um, on LinkedIn. Um, you can find out more about me or about my book at katecolbert.com. The book is called Think Like a Marketer, How a Shift in Mindset Can Change Everything for Your Business. And it's been on the Amazon bestseller list for uh, three and a half years running so far. Um, and it's available. Thank you. Yeah, it's available. Paperback, uh, Kindle edition, audiobook, audio CDs, Vietnamese translation just came out. Um, so world domination. Um, it is a book that will help you create new filters for how to make decisions at work so that mm -hmm. you can create more value for your stakeholders and capture more value back to the bottom line. And if those aren't the reasons for going to work every day, I'm not sure where you're going. So, yeah, um, you so right. um, definitely keep in touch um, LinkedIn. And then I have a Facebook public figure page. Um, if you're interested in learning more about um, me speaking or consulting or what I'm up to or where I'm appearing next, um, you know, even though the Bo and Luke show is really the coolest thing I'm doing this year. Thank you, Kate. Oh, that was great. You. And for everyone listening, we will do a promo with Kate's book right around when the episode releases. So you can get a discount on the book. She'll have some special pricing out there just for you uh, on Amazon. So that'll be awesome. And Luke, any parting thoughts? Kate, you're an awesome human being. We got to talk about Illinois, Portillo's. I'm fascinated by your expertise in marketing and I'm going to be taking you up on connecting on LinkedIn in the future. That's for sure. And I hope yeah, looking listeners forward do to too. It. Yeah, you guys are great. I love you guys. Thank you so much for all that you do and um, love listening to the show. Um, have me back anytime. <laughs> cool. We'll we take will. you up on that. Thank you, Kate. All right. Good night, Bo guys. Good night. Bye. Bo and Luke Nation. That's a wrap. Tune in for a new episode every Thursday. You can subscribe to our email newsletter for information on upcoming guests, giveaways, and more. Rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to our sponsor, Sound United, for quality broadcast audio throughout Season 2.